All right, welcome back. Now, the United Kingdom Supreme Court has ruled in favor of Shell in its case against damages linked to an oil spill from Nigeria's Bonga facility in 2011, one of the largest spills in Nigerian oil exploration history. The action stemmed from the leakage of an estimated 40,000 barrels of crude oil on December 20, 2011, during the loading of an oil tanker at Shell's giant Bonga oil field. That's about 120 kilometer off the coast of the Delta. Shell disputed the allegations and said the Bonga spill was dispersed offshore and did not impact the shoreline. On Wednesday, a group of Nigerian claimants had sought to overturn rulings from two lower courts, arguing that the oil spill constituted a continuing nuisance. But the panel of five justices unanimously upheld rulings by the two lower courts, saying that the leak was a one-off event and had been cleaned up and did not constitute a continuing nuisance now in legal terms. Now, for the purposes of the common law, uh, nuisance course of action, uh, common law now, nuisance course of action. Now, the limitation for nuisance course of action, I should say, the limitation period is six years and the court found the claimants had brought their case after the expiry of a six-year legal deadline for taking action. The case was one of a series of legal tussles Shell has been battling in London courts against residents of Nigeria's oil-producing Delta region. Now, a group of 27,800 individuals and 457 communities have been trying to sue Shell, saying the resulting oil slick polluted their lands and waterways, damaging farming, fishing and drinking water, mangrove forest and religious shrines. Former President, uh, Movement for the Survival of uh, the Ogoni People, Sarah Legwasi Piagbara, now joins me on the program to speak more on this. Uh, Mr. Piagbara, thank you very much for joining us. By the way, he joins us from Port Harcourt. Um, tell me, how, how, how disappointing is this case for uh, this Nigerian claimants now who took Shell to court? Well, well um, thanks, uh, Deji, for having me on this uh, program. I think it is uh, wonderful being here. Um, well, it, it, it is a big disappointment um, uh, uh, looking at the fact that if you look at the number of litigants involved, 27,000 mm. drawn from 457 communities, it means that it's a, a whole lot of people were involved, have been involved in this case. and. Um, Dismissing it as, as the court has done uh, is a huge disappointment to the communities involved, to the people that are affected. It, it means that we are placing technicality above human suffering, which have been the result of this whole uh, OSP case. Hmm. So it's not, it, it, it's not just disappointing, but it's also um, a signal that part of why people were taking cases to outside Nigeria jurisdiction. It because fair people fear that outside here they can get justice, but when it is um, happening the way that just happened, of course it it appears that the door of justice has been closed, which in itself uh, is not good enough in a climate where conflict has been the order of the day. Uh, 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 they, they always say where there is justice, of course there will be peace, and where there is peace, of course there will be absence of conflict. Hmm. But where just denied, as it happened in this case, I get on that case of technology in time of deadline and so-called cause of nuisance, uh, it's it, 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 it not just it's not just disappointing, but of course an invitation to crisis. And that is why perhaps we feel that the judgment was not uh, done in good faith. Now, what impact do you think this judgment could have on other cases that are before uh, various courts now in the United Kingdom against Shell? Well, I, 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 I think it would be hasty to make a general conclusion. Mm. Uh, and for me, each of the cases have their own peculiarities. Um, the, the case by different communities are not the same. They are all uh, uh, cases involving different communities. Uh, also have their own cases um, uh, happen at different times, under different circumstances. So I don't think that this case uh, on its own we have uh, uh, the same impact on other cases, except where the same argument of deadline and the cause of misery will be brought up. 
But so far, I think that uh, it will not necessarily be a standard for judging other cases. So I'm not, uh, I'm not seeing it being uh, um, a yardstick for measuring how they're going to pass judgment in other cases. Because one of the cases, of course, I was just going to, I, I, I was going to ask you about is uh, the Ogale Abile case against Shell. Now I'm just wondering if you think there might be some implications uh, for for that case now uh, arising from uh, the, the the Supreme Court judgment on on this one. Well, it still boils down to the same thing. Uh, um, there is there is a sense of fear and there is a sense of. Uh, worry but as i said they are different cases and uh, I, 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 for me to be hasty to just make that generalization that this job is also going to affect that i mean the the bill of garlic has gone through uh, his own uh, different stages i i am I'm, I'm quite hopeful that it may not be the same thing now if i may ask you why 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 go to the U United Kingdom, for instance? Is it that these communities, and of course you're also from, uh, you know, you're also from that region now, is it that you people do not believe you can get justice in, in the courts in Nigeria? That's why you're all heading to the United Kingdom? Well, that, 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 is, uh, that is part of it. Many, um, many of the community members have also lost faith in the Nigerian judicial system. And um, most people feel that going abroad can help them get justice. And uh, the, the ranging from the Kensarua versus uh, share case, and uh, of course the border uh, share case, I mean, these are cases that we've seen that if they were litigated in Nigeria, hmm. would not have of course, got in the sort of judgment or perhaps the settlement that have been reached in most of these cases. And that is why communities feel strongly that going abroad, I mean, uh, in other jurisdictions, can help them get justice. But not just getting justice, but getting it faster than it to be done in Nigeria, where sometimes you file a case, it takes you 10, 20, 30 years. Sometimes those who started the case may even die before the judgment is issued. And when the job is eventually issued again, the community. So, and of course, there is um, there is also uh, imagine understanding as far as these whole issues are concerned. Issue of uh, company liability, issue of um, extraterritorial legislation. Imagine, and of course, the whole question of parent company liability, hmm. which are some of the issues that have been thrown in some of these cases now. The strong case of parent company liability, where people are taking a uh, companies to, to call, particularly in their own, uh, where their parent companies are located. In the case of Shell, of course, it's still the UK and the Netherlands. And that is where most of us are going uh, over to the UK or the Netherlands because that is where we see the, 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 the headquarters of these companies are. Uh, and we, of course, impose some liability on them. So I think as the year go by, we are seeing emerging trends of argument which is favoring this sort of litigation outside the the home countries i mean the countries of the victims now as, as a former president of the movement for the survival of the ogoni people i mean um the the issue of remediation of, of um, the, the polluted area of ogoni is is always in the front burner um for, for a very long time now, the government has been involved in what, what it calls a, a cleaning up program in, in Ogoni as a whole and, uh, of course, setting up a, a body that is responsible for the cleaning up of, of, um, uh, of uh, that, that area now, following the U, uh, UNEP report now. Uh, can you tell us exactly where things stand at the moment? Uh, um, is that process proceeding uh, as smoothly? Uh, is the environment being cleaned up? Well, the, 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 I, I have been a part of this whole process right from the time of the assessment. Um, of course, the struggle has been part of my life for a long time. I spent the last 30 years of my life in this whole struggle. And uh, at every point, I, I have played my own role. Um, of course, this whole thing started with the whole campaign in the early 90s. And uh, we got to the point where the 
in the heat of the Boni crisis, the UN created what they call the UN Special Repertoire on Nigeria, uh, who uh, came to Nigeria and eventually made the recommendation uh, at the then Commission of Human Rights in Geneva that there need to be an environmental study of Boniland. Of course, it took us another eight years of campaign before the Nigerian government responded. By and during the time of the study, I I served as the liaison between Mossop and the UNEP. And uh, of course, we know some of the challenges we had to go through. Uh, eventually, the report was published. It took us another campaign again for the 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 government in a multi-stakeholder engagement process mm. involving Shell, the Ogoni community, and the federal government in a negotiation process that took us to Abuja, from Abuja to Geneva, and back to Abuja, where we agreed on the structures and the process. Um, looking back, some progress has been made in terms of uh, the, the remediation process. Mm. But the truth remains that the process has been slow, um, not just slow, um, some of the key measures of uh, achievement have not been, uh, have not been achieved. I mean, looking at the fact that we're talking about provision of water to many communities, we are talking about the health study, we're talking about the, of course, the remediation itself. I think the focus has been more on the remediation, which, as I said, have been slow. Now, another big concern is that we, we are departing from the original agreement that the three parties reached. Because for me, driving that process, because this thing happened during my time as president of Mosul, we were keen on breaking new ground. We were keen, I mean, for the first time in the world, to create a multi-stakeholder structure in with the community, the government, and of course, the, the, the shell, I mean, the oil industry, who are the cause of the so-called pollution, come together to find a common solution to the environmental crisis in Ogoni land. That was the sort of structure that we tried to put in, in, I mean, together. I mean, in doing this, we try to check other parts of the world where there have been oil spills, and we find some areas where there have been success, we find some areas where there have been failures, and we try to put all this together in trying to put what we try to put together in Nigeria. Unfortunately, the government itself at the moment is not respecting that multi-stakeholder spirit that drove the setting up of the high prep. The government itself is not driving as, as if it is purely a government agenda, neglecting mm -hmm. the other two parties which involve, of course, the oil industry and not, of course, the community. And that is where there is some problem at the moment. This intervention was supposed to be a conflict settlement intervention where the community, the government and the oil industry that have been implicated in this crisis are coming together to find common solutions to the environmental crisis. Unfortunately, what we are seeing now is more of the federal government itself assuming entire control of the project and running in a way that doesn't respect, of course, the other stakeholders in this whole discourse. That is where the challenge is. Mm -hmm. And that is where we have some trouble at the moment. Because this is supposed to be driven by that multi-stakeholder approach and system that we put in place. But that is not happening at the moment. That is where the problem is. Uh, and, and for me, when it goes to that extent, of course, it may end up being wrong like the usual Nigeria intervention agencies that we see some of the crisis we are seeing with NDDC today. And that is part of what we are running away from, that in this process, the three stakeholders will come together at every stage to agree on any action that is going to be taken in the interest of the community, the, the government itself, and of course, the oil industry is bringing the funds. But I'm afraid to say that that is not what we are seeing on the ground at the moment. Now, you, you, you did talk about the cause of oil spill, and uh, it's, it's been a, a subject of debate between uh, some of these oil companies, oil companies generally and uh, the, the communities. You look at all the cases that, um, uh, that uh, communities are taking up against Shell. Um, some of the contentious issues uh, revolves around who is actually responsible for, for, for the spill. Shell has often maintained that majority of these spills are caused by um, the, the people on the ground, by, 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 by the communities, people in the communities, that 
there at the course of the spill. And, and then uh, when they cause this spillage, they, they now throw the blame on them and all of that. What have you got to say about that? Well, well, well I, mm -hmm. I think um, we need to go into doing a serious, uh, 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 far more greater research on the politics of OSP in the Niger Delta. Um, and for me, uh, that is, that is, that, uh, we need to differentiate the issue relating to oil bunkering and uh, what you may call uh, yeah, oil bunkering and all that. Uh, there are need of, for us to separate that from the oil spill on the ground. Uh, um, when the Ogoni study was done, of course, I know that as at the time you name commission, I mean the federal government commissions, uh, you name to do this to do this study, it was clear that they were looking at oil spillages that are taking place in Ogoni years before now. Mm. Now, well, there's something that was very coincident, uh, that was um, very suspicious during the course of the study, challenging every oil industry person. Before the assessment in Ogoni land, there was nothing called oil boil green or additional refining. Anybody can challenge me and go to check whether before 2006, if there was anything called oil bone green going on in Ogoni land. But as soon as the assessment began in 2009, then suddenly we started hearing about bone green additional refining. As, uh, as the, 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 the program person in, in, in charge of this process in most of them, I think our strong suspicion was that there are some oil company collaborators with some fringe of the community or some people from elsewhere to cause this whole thing about oil bunkering and all that so that they will place the, 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 the cost of the oil space mm. on the going community. And that was some of the things that we suspected. And of course, eventually, when UNEV was about running up their study and there was a preliminary report, that was the claim that UNEV tried to put forward. And then there was challenge to UNEV by Amnesty International and other advocacy groups around the world that have done their own study before now to say, tell us the basis of your own report and claim. And at that point, that UNEV had to withdraw that position because they know that something was happening behind the scene that led to that conclusion. So for me, the whole question about oil spill in the Niger Delta, I mean, as we coming from most of the communities, it is true it's coming from equipment failure. It is coming from some of the malpractices of the oil industry. That does not say, or that does not also, I will not at this point claim that there have not been cases where some community you that damage oil spill, I, I, I will be uh, wrong to entirely claim so. But the majority of the oil spill incidences mm. are actually coming from equipment failure and other malpractices of the oil industry. So it's not something they have to put on the community, but also on their own. Because I come to think of it, they are giving money in terms of surveillance. They do surveillance contracts, they do pipeline monitoring contracts. So where are these people when these pipes are, are so-called tampered with? Mm. That is the question. Shell is voting in money in the name of surveillance contract. They're voting in money in the name of pipeline monitoring. So who and who is responsible for breaking these pipes if there are actually people you are paying to monitor the pipes? I think I get, I get, I get your point there. Saro Legbosi Piagbara, former president, the movement uh, for the survival of the Ogoni people. Thank you very much, sir, for coming on the program. And thank you for sharing your time with us. Oh, thank you for having me on. Thank you so very much. Uh. All right, that's how much we can take on the program this week. We thank you very much for watching. I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>